and you recommend somebody, and you say, well, sure, take your car over there to John. He'll do you a good job, and he'll charge you a reasonable price. Well, now, I don't know whether that's true or not. The best I can do with that information is if I believe you strong enough, I'll take my car over there to John. And sure enough, he does a good job, charges me a reasonable price. When I leave there, I know that he will do that. When I went there, I believed he would do that based on what you told me. Now, six months from now, I have trouble with my car again. And I don't ask you or anybody else where to take it. I take it right back to John. Only this time, I took it on faith. I took it on knowledge. The first time, I went there on belief. You can't start with faith. You can only start with belief. And all we have to do to start this thing is to believe or be willing to believe that there's a power greater than ourselves that can restore us to sanity. And he said it had been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. Asterisk, bottom of the page, and again we're referred to the spiritual experience. The wonderfully effective spiritual structure that we're going to build is the spiritual experience. Step one, willingness was the foundation of it. Step two, believing, is the cornerstone of it. And later on, he'll tell us exactly what that is, and we're going to pass through it to freedom. So we don't have to wait till we get to step 12 to get something. Already, we're beginning to change our ideas and attitudes and emotions. The personality is beginning to change as we begin to believe that there is a power greater than ourselves that can restore us to sanity. If I know I need the power, if I know the beginning of it is simply to believe, then probably the next thing I'm going to need is what kind of procedure am I going to follow in order to find this power? Let's go to page 51. See, this world of ours has made more material progress in the last century than all the millenniums which went before. Almost everyone knows the reasons. Students of ancient history tell us that the intellect of men in those days was equal to the best of today. Yet in ancient times, material progress was painfully slow. The spirit of modern scientific inquiry, research, and invention was almost unknown. And why, I, I wonder sometimes, why is it that we have cell phones and televisions and jet airplanes and cars and those people two, three hundred years ago don't have those things. Why didn't they? Are we just smarter than they are? Well, our book says here that the history tells us the intellect of men in those days was equal to the best of today. Intellect means the capacity to learn. They had the same capacity to learn as we do. But yet, in the realm of material, men's minds were fettered by superstition, tradition, and all sorts of fixed ideas. Those are the things that kept them in the dark ages. Superstition, tradition, and all sorts of fixed ideas. See, I need an open mind more today than I've ever needed an open mind. Because superstition and tradition and all sorts of fixed ideas will keep me in the dark ages. You know, we had a, a little situation here in our country a couple of hundred years ago, a little better. Most people came to the northeast corner of our country for religious freedom. And uh, everybody there was practicing their religious freedoms as they understood it. And as long as everybody practiced their religion somewhat like everybody else did, we got along just fine. But if you had any ideas that was contrary to the, the group conscious, so to speak, of that area, and you expressed them, guess what they'd do for you? They'd burn you at the stake for being a witch, wouldn't they? So if you had any ideas that were contrary to the group conscious, you certainly didn't express them. You kept them to yourself. So superstition tradition and all sorts of fixed ideas kept people in the dark ages. Today, I think in America, our minds are open to allow everybody to practice whatever they want to in any way they want to do it. But we took off the, the uh, superstitions and the traditions and the fixed ideas from our minds that are open to many, many things. He says some of the contemporaries of Columbus thought a round earth preposterous. And I think Columbus is one of the great examples uh, of what you can do and what you can change. 
providing you're willing to set aside superstition and tradition and fixed ideas, providing you're willing to change some things. Now, the first thing you got to do to change anything is to be willing to do so. Write down these little key words because they're important, and willing is the first. And what made Columbus willing to change is they were trying to find a new trade route to the East Indies. They had found gold, silk, and spices there, and it took years to get there because the only way they had to go was to travel to the northeast end of the Mediterranean Sea, then travel by land, camelback, horseback, footback, or however they traveled, to get to the East Indies, and it took years to get there and get back. And they were trying to find a new trade route so they could get there and get back a lot faster. Columbus came along, and Columbus undoubtedly was alcoholic. He almost had to be. <laughs> because to be willing, be willing to state something that, that is in contradiction to everything that everybody else believes. Columbus said, you know, I believe that we can get east by sailing west. Now, if that isn't drunk thinking, I don't know what is. <laughs> and Columbus was tough and stubborn and bullheaded because he was willing to stand there and say, I don't believe this thing is flat. You know, everybody thought it was flat. And somebody had suggested, could we get to the East Indies by sailing the other direction? And they had said, well, no, dummy, you can't do that. If you sail out there, you're going to sail right off the edge of this thing. You know, I don't know why they thought that. I, I assume people sailed out there and didn't come back, and they assumed that they sailed off the edge of it. And Columbus was big enough to say, I don't think this thing is flat. He said, I think this thing is round. And he said, I think we can really get east by sailing west. Another reason we think he was alcoholic is because when he left, he didn't know where he was going. <laughs> and when he got there, he didn't know where he was. And when he got back, he didn't even know where he had been. <laughs> but what really made him an alcoholic is a woman financed the whole trip for him. Yeah. She did that twice. Now, Columbus followed a little formula that the world has always known that if you want to change anything, there's a certain procedure you have to follow. And the first thing you have to do is be willing to change. That's the first willing. You know, trying to find the new trade route to get there, back, get there and get back faster made Columbus willing to change his belief. The second thing you have to do is change what you believe. And Columbus said, I don't believe she's flat. I believe she's round. And he said, I believe we can get east by sailing west. But his belief didn't do him any good either. Because he's still standing on the shore of the ocean the day he expressed that belief. Some days, weeks, months, years later, Columbus made a decision. That's the third thing you have to do if you're going to change anything. And he said, by golly, I'm going to go find out whether this thing is really round or flat, if he can really get east by sailing west. But his decision didn't do him any good either. Because he's still standing on the shore of the ocean the day he expressed the decision. Some days, weeks, months, years later, he began to take some action. And that's the fourth thing you have to do if you're going to change anything, is take a little action. He went to the king of Portugal to get the money. And the king, being an astute businessman, said, Columbus, there's no way I'm going to let you have this money. You'll sail out there, and you'll sail right off the edge of this sucker, and I'll lose it all. That's why he ended up with the Queen of Spain. He went to her and he sweet-talked her out of the money on the promise that he would bring back gold, silk, and spices. She gave him the money and he bought three ships. He put provisions in those three ships. He put crew members in those three ships. And they began to go east by sailing west, day after day after day sailing west. Now, we don't know for sure, but we've got a pretty strong suspicion that on his first trip, he probably hired a special sailor, put him on the bow of the lead ship at night with a lantern, whispered in his ear, said, I believe this thing is round, but if you see the edge of this damn thing, you holler so we can get turned around. 
After having sailed straight west day after day after day after day, they got results from the action they took. They found land on the other side. Now we know that he thought it was the East Indies. It wasn't. It was the West Indies. But he had proven to himself that the world is round. It's not flat. You will not sail off the edge of it. He turned right around and came right back to Europe. Went right back to the Queen of Spain. And she said, Columbus, where's the gold, silk, and spices you promised you would bring me? And he said, sweetheart, I didn't find any. But he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll refinance me, I'll go back. Trust me, honey. And this time I'll find it. <laughs> and she refinanced him. And he got some more ships, more provisions, more crew members. And they began to go east by sailing west with one big difference. He didn't hire the special sailor, put him on a bow of the lead ship at night with a lantern, because you see, this time he went back in faith. The first time he believed. The second time he knew. The second time he had faith. You can't start with faith. The best you can do is to start with belief. I'd like to sit here today and tell you that the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are brand new that the world's never seen anything like them before. But if I did, I'd tell you a lie. Because they're based on the same principles that Columbus and every other human being has ever used to change anything. The first thing you have to do is to be willing. That's our step one. When we can realize that what we're doing is no longer going to work, when we give up completely, then we're willing to change, and that's step one. The second thing you have to do is to believe you can do so, and that's step two. But the belief will do no good without a decision. So the third thing we have to do is to make a decision, and that's step three. And the book says that step three will have little permanent effect unless we follow it by a strenuous course of action, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. And then in step 12, we get results. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I no longer believe that God will restore me to sanity. I know that He will because He has done so as the result of these steps. Now those of us who've had a spiritual awakening, we no longer believe that God will do so we can now go back and help the next newcomer come to believe. And they can make a decision, and we can take them by the hand and walk with them through the action steps, and they'll have a spiritual awakening, and then they'll know, and they can go help the next newcomer come to believe. There's only one thing that you and I can't do for the newcomer. We can't make them willing. Willingness is a one-person job. And how does an alcoholic become willing to change? Very simple. Drinking whiskey. A lot of it. And when you drink enough of it and you're damn near dead from it, then you become willing to change. And then we can help you believe and we can help you decide and we can help you act. I had a guy come to me and he said, I've been in AA for five years, been working on step one for the last five years. I said, no, you haven't. I said, you don't work on step one in AA. You work on step one out there drinking whiskey. And when you're desperate enough, then you'll be willing to change, and then AA can help you. Until that time, there's really nothing we can do for the newcomer. Isn't that something? Simple little procedure that always seems to work, Joe. Okay, let's go to uh, 55. If we know we need God, if we know the beginning of it is to simply believe, if we know the procedure to follow, about the only other thing we need to know, well, where are we going to find this God? And I think we're just as confused about that as we are about anything, period. You know, as a kid growing up, I got a, mind, a picture in my mind. I don't know whether I saw it or dreamed it. But to me, God was a tall, elderly gentleman standing up in the sky on a cloud long flowing white robes, long flowing white hair, golden halo around his head, sun rays shooting out of that halo, 
and a big stick in his right hand. Now, I don't know whether I dreamed that or whether I saw it, but I think one of the reasons that I was pretty sure God was up there is I noticed every time the minister talked about God, he always pointed up there. But then what really confused me is I noticed every time he wanted to talk to God, he looked down here. (laughs) Hell, no wonder we get confused as kids growing up in church. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked and I never could find this God thing. And one of the reasons is I never knew knew where God dwelt. It is only when I come to page 55 in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous that I begin to realize where God really is. I had this little fellow, he was in a halfway house and he asked me to be his sponsor. He said, what do you think I should do? I said, well, the first thing I think you should do is get a job and get out of this halfway house. It's not good for you. He's well easy for you to say, I don't have any wheels. If I had a car, I could find a job. He said, I'm well qualified. I said, well, I'll take you back and forth and help you find a job and take you back and forth and to help you to, to get a couple of paychecks and you can get you a car. And that's good. So we got him a job and we were going back and forth and all the time I'm thinking I'm helping him. And one morning he told me a story that kind of changed my life. And this is the way it went. He said there was these three wise men for the East, that's the way he put it. And they stole from man and woman the crown of life, took it away from them, the thing that would make us the happiest. And he said, well, what are we going to do with it now that we took it away from them? Well, one of them said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take it to the highest, highest mountain on the face of the earth, and we'll hide it in the highest crevice, and they'll never be able to find it there. The other two said, yeah, but you know how they are. They'll hunt, and they'll search, and they'll eventually find it. The other one said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take it to the deepest ocean and the deepest crevice in the ocean and hide it there. They'll never be able to find it there. The other two said, yeah, but you know how they are. They'll hunt and they'll search and they'll eventually find it. The third one said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's hide it within himself, and he'll never look for it there. And our book said, yet we've been seeing another kind of flight, a spiritual liberation from this world. People rose above their problems. They said God made these things possible, and we only smiled. We had seen spiritual release, but like to tell ourselves it wasn't true. Actually, we were fooling ourselves. For deep down in every man, woman, and child is a fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship, by other things, but in some form or other it's there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. See, we're just born with it. It's just there, always was there. We finally saw that faith in some kind of a God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. And the last analysis is only there that it may be found, and it was so with us. You know, today we believe that every human being seems to be born with some kind of knowledge, probably lying at a subconscious level, that seems to be able to tell us what we should do and what we shouldn't do seems to be able to tell us how to live and how not to live. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people would like to call that common sense. Other people might want to call it innate intelligence. Others might want to call it the conscience. And some might want to call it the soul. And I don't think it really makes any difference what we call it, as long as we recognize the fact that it's there. And it's always been there in my life. As far back as I can remember, I used to be getting ready to do something and some voice from within me would say, Charlie, I don't believe you ought to be doing this. And I wouldn't pay a bit of attention to it. And I'd go right ahead and do it and just get in one hell of a mess. And that same little voice would say, see, I told you not to do that in the first place. You know, I don't think we had to be taught that kind of stuff. I think it's always been there from the day we were born. Now, if that's true, and if that's God, and my book says it is, then what that really means to me today, if God dwells within me, then I've got my own personal God. You see, I don't worry anymore about whether He's the God of the Baptist Church or not. I don't worry about whether He's the God of the Catholic Church, the Hebrew religion, or anybody else's religion. If He dwells within me, He's my God. And he and I can come together in very simple 
very understandable terms. That's one of the greatest things that I've learned in my lifetime, that I don't have to go out and find God. God's here. And if he dwells within me, he dwells within you too. And if we listen to that voice inside ourselves, you know, usually we know what we should do and, and what we shouldn't do. It doesn't always keep us from doing the things we shouldn't do, but we certainly know the difference before we ever get into those kind of things. Now then, my book has pretty well told me in this chapter that in order to be able to recover, I'm going to have to find the power greater than I am. It's also told me I can have my own conception of that power, whatever I want God to be. It's also told me that in order to start the finding of that power, that all I have to do is to believe or be willing to believe that there is such a power. It's also told me where I'm going to find that power. Now my whole idea is about God has changed throughout this chapter. It's allowed me to discard that old hell, fire, and damnation that I used to think about God. It's allowed me to have some new ideas about God. Now then, am I ready to make a decision? You betcha. I never could have made it the old way, but now then I'm going to be able to make a decision about this God thing. One of the greatest things I've ever read. Yeah, there's next little paragraph that sums it whole up, the whole chapter. He said, we can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, which is old ideas, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. And get this next line. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. See, it's not in the finding. It's in the seeking. And if we seek God into our lives, he will disclose himself to us, and we'll have a God of our own understanding. Earlier there in our book, it said that God either is or isn't. God is everything or else he's nothing. And what was my choice going to be? And I had to make that choice for me. I can't make it for anybody else. And the consciousness of my belief has came to me. And as every year that goes by, my understanding of God changes a little bit because I need an open mind. I keep an, try to keep an open mind. I hope I never get to a point that I can say, well, this is God, and there is nothing outside that box, because I would be limiting God in my life. I don't want to do that. I try to keep the limits off and just seek God into my life, and he discloses himself to me one day at a time. Again, I can see Bill as he finishes up this chapter saying to himself, well, I'm able to show them the problem. In the doctor's opinion, in my story, Bill's story, I was able to show them the solution in chapter 2. I was able to show them in chapter 3 what's going to happen to them if they don't find that solution. And I was able to give them some new ideas in chapter 4 so that they would be willing to make a decision about that solution. And he probably says to himself, I think I've told them all the preliminary information they need to be able to see the problem and see the solution. And he says, now then it's time to get down to the main object of the book, to show them how to find that power greater than they are so they can recover from alcoholism. And Bill proceeds to sit down and start writing on chapter 5, how it works. And he always said he had extreme difficulty with chapter 5 for two or three different reasons. Number one, they had made six little steps from the Oxford Group program, and Bill could see loopholes in those six little steps that the alcoholic mind was slipping through. And he said he felt that this, those steps needed to be expanded to give them more strength and more depth for we alcoholics. He didn't know how far, but he felt they needed to be expanded. Also, he was having difficulty again with this God thing. Because you see, by, by this time, we had many different people from different religions coming into AA. We had the Protestants, and we had the Catholics, and we had some Jewish people coming in, and we had a sprinkling of Muslims showing up. And he's getting ready to tell us how to, how to find God. 
and not be able to offend any of those people would seem to be almost an impossible task. And he said he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried and he just simply could not get started. And he said one night while in bed, leaning against the headboard, pillow behind his back, pad and pencil in hand, trying to start chapter five, and he said, finally, I just gave up. And said, I put the pad and pencil down and I prayed. And I asked God for the right thought and the right direction and the help. And he said, I prayed and meditated for 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes. And he said, I then picked up the pad and pencil, and it felt as if the pencil had a mind of its own as it raced across the pages. In less than 30 minutes, Bill had written how it works, that thing that we read at all of our AA meetings today. Now, we're going to read how it works, but we're not going to read how it works out of the big book. We're going to read how it works from the original manuscript as Bill wrote it that night before the other members got to look at it and before they insisted that he make some changes in it. And I think by, by looking at the original how it works, we're going to really be able to see what Bill really intended for us to do as far as how it works is concerned. And I'm going to ask Joe to read it. And perhaps by pausing or changing the tone of his voice, he can point out the real differences. And if you want to go through it with us in your book and compare it, I think you'll see the differences quite easily. Joe? Okay, chapter 5, How It Works, the Original Manuscript. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our directions. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a way of life which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. If you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to follow directions. <laughs> At some of these, you may balk. You may think you can find an easier, softer way. We doubt if you can. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go, absolutely. Remember that you are dealing with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for you. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. You must find him now. Half measures will avail you nothing. You stand at the turning point. Throw yourself under his protection and care with complete abandon. Now we think you can take it. <laughs> Here are the steps we took which are suggested as your program of recovery. One, admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care and direction of of God as we understood him. Over to the care and direction of God as we understood him. Remember that. We'll refer to it later on. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely willing that God remove all the defects of character. Seven, humbly, on our knees, ask him to remove our shortcomings, holding nothing back. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make complete amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our contact with God, 
praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual experience as a result of this course of action, we tried to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Now you may exclaim, what an order, I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We're not saints. The point is that we're willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic. That's the doctor's opinion. Some of it in chapter 2 and 3. Most of it in the doctor's opinion. The chapter to the agnostic. That's chapter 4. And our personal adventures before and after. Bill's story and those in the back of the book. Have been designed to sell you. Three pertinent ideas. Well, Bill was a salesman, you see. A, that you are alcoholic and cannot manage your own life. Step one. B, that probably no human power can relieve your alcoholism. Part of step two. C, that God can and will. The rest of step two. Now, if you're not convinced on these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else just throw it away. (laughs) Quite easy to see what Bill had in mind, isn't it? He didn't, meant, he didn't mean for it to be a set of suggestions. He meant for it to be a set of directions. He said so two or three different times. A set of directions to the individual alcoholic on how to recover from alcoholism. And when the other members saw that, that's when the crap hit the fan. They said, Bill, you don't have any business giving directions to anybody. You can't tell other people what they're going to have, what they have to do. And they said, Bill, some of this stuff like humbly on our knees, ask him to remove our shortcomings, holding nothing back. They said, that sounds too much like the Oxford group absolutes. And we don't like that, and you need to change it. And Bill said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to change these things. And they said, well, yeah, you are. <laughs> they said, don't you remember? This is our book, not your book. And Bill said, yeah, but what you guys don't realize, he said, these really aren't even my words. He said, these are God's words. They came after prayer and meditation. And they said, we don't give a damn whose words they are. (laughs) And the fight was on. And they almost destroyed not only the book project, but they almost destroyed the little fellowship over the writing of how it works. And finally, finally, Bill realized he was going to have to compromise. And at the suggestion of a non-alcoholic psychiatrist who was around in those days, Bill agreed to make some changes. The psychiatrist said, why don't you change it from directions to suggestions? And he said, you'll still get your idea across, and probably more people would accept it. And he said, where you keep saying you, you, you. He said, don't do that. Say, we, we, we. Say, this is what we had to do, not what you have to do. And he said, where you saying must and must, change that kind of wording to ought. And he said, you'll still get your ideas across, and more people would probably use your book. Now, today, we don't know. If they hadn't made those changes, maybe instead of two million worldwide today, we might have ten million worldwide But by the same token, if they hadn't made the changes, instead of 2 million worldwide, we might have 10,000 worldwide. Nobody knows. We just know that this is the history behind this particular part of the book. But Bill was cunning, baffling, and powerful also. And he said, okay, I'm going to make these changes, but you guys are going to have to compromise with me. And they said, what do you want? And he said, I'm tired. He said, I've been fighting with you and arguing with you all the way through this thing. And he said, I'm not going to do this anymore. If you want me to finish the book, you give me the authority to do so. And if you don't want to give me the authority to do so, then you finish the book. Well, they didn't want to give him that authority, but they didn't want to finish the book either. (laughs) They very reluctantly agreed to that. Now, what Bill knew that they didn't know is two pages later, He's going to put you and must and directions right back in the book. He 
He's had it all the way up to this point, jerks it out of how it works, and then he sticks it right back in, and it ruins some of the continuity of the book. But now that we know what happened, we can see what he had in mind. The other thing that is, that is so important, when it talks about our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. That's step one. B, that probably no human power could relieve our alcoholism. That's step two. C, that God could and would, and that's the rest of step two. It's evident that all the information we need for steps one and two will be found in the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. People come to us today and they say, well, how do you work steps one and two? And we say, you don't. They're not working steps. No action involved. They are conclusions of the mind that we draw based on the information presented to us in the doctor's opinion and the first four chapters. You see, I've always been powerless over alcohol. My life was always unmanageable because of that. I just did not know that, nor did I know why, until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. There's always been a power greater than I am that could restore me to sanity. I just not, did not believe that that power would do so, nor did I understand the insanity I had to be restored from until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. Now, if I can say to myself today, you bet you I'm powerless over alcohol. My life has become unmanageable, and I'm through with step one. If I can say to myself today, you bet you, I believe there's a power greater than I am that can restore me to sanity, then I'm through with step two. And I don't think it's by accident the very next thing in the big book says, being convinced we are now at step three. See, the real fallacy in starting a newcomer in chapter five is we're starting trying to start them on, chap on step three. And they don't have one and two behind them yet. This is what we, we as sponsors need to be sure that we lead the new people through the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters and make them aware of these ideas and then they'll be ready for step three. I think it's break time. What do you think? I think so too. Let's take about 15, 20 minutes. We'll come right back, jump into step three and four. Please. Six, page 60, please, there. if you will. Look at there. Look there. Look there. Boy, it works. <laughs> He's got the power, doesn't he? Our book says that being convinced. Being convinced of what? Well, the, steps one and two. The doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. Being convinced we were at step three. We're not ready to take step three yet. We're just at step three which is we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understand, understood him. Just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? We're going to make a decision to turn our will. And what is our will? Our will is our thinking. And our life is our actions. So we're getting ready to make a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. Over the care and direction of God as we understood him. Always as we, we look at step three, there's really three words in there we like to look at pretty closely. And the first word is the word decision. You know, I hear a lot of people say today, well, I've been in AA three or four years, and my life's still all screwed up, and I don't understand why, because I turned it over to God two years ago when I took step three. No, we don't turn anything at all over to God when we take step three. We make a decision to do something. And the decision itself implies there's going to have to be some further action to carry that decision out. Just like Columbus's decision did him no good until he began to take action. In my own life, a few years ago, my wife Barbara and I, we decided to go to California and visit some relatives. But we didn't do anything to carry that decision out, and sure enough, we didn't get to California either. Second year in a row, we made the same decision. Still didn't do anything to carry it out, and we didn't get to California the second year. 
Third year in a row, we made a decision. Only this time, it was a little different. I took the car down and had it serviced. Barbara packed the clothes and a little food, and we got in our automobile, and we drove from our home to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Then we drove to Oklahoma City, and then we drove to Amarillo, Texas, and then we drove to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then we drove to Flagstaff, Arizona, and then we drove to Barstow, California, and then we drove to San Bernardino, and one day we ended up in Los Angeles visiting with our relatives, not because we made a decision, but because we took the action necessary to carry out that decision. So I think it's important that everybody really understand in step three, all we're doing is making a decision. What is it we're deciding to do? We're making a decision to turn our will over to the care, and the book originally said, and direction of God as we understood Him. Now, what is our will? Our will is nothing more than our thinking apparatus. Our will is nothing more than this thing up here in our head that tells us what to do and what not to do. Our will is nothing more than our mind. Tying the word will and mind together. You know, let's, let's say that, uh, that some of us are beginning to, to approach the end of our lives, which some of us in this room are getting along that pretty long in years. And we become concerned with what we're going to do with these things that we've gathered up in our lifetime. And if we get concerned enough, we'll go down and sit down with an attorney. And we'll tell that attorney what we want done with these things. I want this to go to my spouse, and this is to go to my daughter, and I want this to go to my son, and etc. Now that attorney will take my thinking as of that day, coming from my mind, and put it down on paper in the written form, legal form. I'll sign it. Maybe the attorney will sign it as a witness. Two or three years from now, I kick the bucket. And if my family's like all the rest of them, they're going to call that undertaker, and they're going to say, come and get him, and let's get him ready, and let's get him out to that cemetery about as fast as we can. <laughs> now, used to, hell, they waited about a week or so to put you in the ground. Now they do it in just two or three days. They don't, don't waste any time anymore. We get out to the cemetery, and they've got me in a box, suspended over a hole in the ground and a few people standing around it I hope and somebody will say a prayer and I hope at least it'll be a good AA member after those little services they start dropping me down in that hole now if my family's like the rest of them they're not going to wait till I get to the bottom of the hole <laughs> just as just as I'm about halfway down as soon as I get started down in there they run and jump in the car and they go to that attorney's office. And that attorney gets out that piece of paper and reads to them what my thinking was two or three years prior to that time while I'm sitting there in, his, in that office. And we know that they call that piece of paper a will. It's not by accident. Will, thinking, mind are all synonymous. So I'm making a decision to turn my thinking apparatus over to the care and direction of God as I understood Him. What else am I trying to turn over? I'm making a decision to turn my life over to the care and direction of God as I understand Him. And we know that all by, by life is nothing more than my actions. What I am right now as of this moment sitting behind this table is a sum accumulative total of all the actions I've taken throughout my entire lifetime has made me what I am right now. Now we know that all action is born in thought. Say that again, please. All action is born in thought. Sometimes we react to a situation so rapidly we think we do it automatically, but we don't. I can't even reach out and pick up this cup of coffee unless my mind tells my body to do so. So if all action is born in thought, then it stands to reason my life is going to be determined by how I think. If my thinking is okay, chances are my actions are okay, and chances are my life's going to be okay. But if my thinking is lousy, then chances are my actions are going to be lousy, and my life's going to be lousy too. I shall never forget when I got to step three. 
I went to my sponsor and I said, Neil, I don't think I'm going to be able to take step three. And he said, why? And I said, because if I take step three, I have no idea what God, if I turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him, I have no idea what he would have me be. And he may want me to be a missionary. And he may want to send me to China. And I sure as hell don't want to go to China. <laughs> and he just laughed and he said, well, let's look at it this way. At least it wouldn't be in the hands of an idiot, would it? <laughs> he said, Charlie, let's look back in your lifetime. He said, you've always been a selfish, self-centered, self-willed human being. You've always done what you want to do whenever you want to do it, and the hell with the rest of them. And he said, Is that, isn't that right? And I said, well, yeah, you know it is. And he said, well, the end result is you've damn near destroyed your life. And he said, just as important, you've almost destroyed the lives of those around you that care for you. He said, just think, if God could direct your thinking, it might become better. And he said, if your thinking becomes better, your, your actions are going to become better. And if your actions become better than your life, and just as importantly, the lives of those around you that care for you will probably become better also. But he said, left on your own resources, you don't stand a chance. He said, you'll always think the way you've always thought. You'll keep on doing the same old things. And you'll continue to destroy your life and the lives of those around you. And he stepped back about three feet stuck his bony old finger right in the middle of my chest, and he said, now you have to make the decision. He said, I wish I could make it for you. But he said, I can't. This is one you'll have to make on your own. Making the decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God is your understanding, hoping that things will become better. Okay, it says the first requirement. He's going to give us some instructions now. Here, here they are. They come fa pretty fast and sweet. He said the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show. is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. If his arrangement was only stay put, if only the people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. I, I still believe that if my wife would mind, everything would be wonderful. <laughs> and she, she would have a better life if she'd do what I told her to do. <laughs> but she hasn't minded in 37 years. I don't think she's going to. <laughs> but I still th sometimes think it will. You know... Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. That's the trouble. See, God gave us all a self-will. And that's the trouble with self-will. Everybody's got one. My, my will for my wife is one thing. And her will for her life is another. And quite often, my will for her is different than her will for her. And we have problems if I try to enforce my will on her. So I've learned not to do that a whole lot. But the book says that the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will could hardly be... A success. You know, uh, we need to know a little bit about what self-will is, I think. Because uh, in uh, 1953 or 4, Bill put, wrote the 12 and 12 after 12 or 13 years after he wrote the big book. And he didn't uh, know as much about self-will when he wrote the big book as he learned in uh, 1954, 55. And uh, he wrote down there on the pay on, on the, in the area of the fourth step, he wrote down a bunch of information about the basic instincts of life, what, which created itself. And he had a lot more experience with us alcoholics by the time 1953, 54, 55 run around. He would consulted an awful lot of uh, other people, very learned men about self-will. And he put it in the, in the 12 and 12 in the area of the fourth step. And when I sponsor people, I suggest to them that they go to the fourth step in the 12 and 12 and read all they can about the basic instincts of life. Because that information and the working knowledge of those words is what we're going to use later on to fill out the third column in the fourth step on page 65. Now, we have noticed over the years that page 65 and the third column is what really gets most people. They don't know what, part, what self is. 
so they kind of skip over that as I did. So uh, he wrote for us in the 12 and 12, The Basic Instincts of Life. He, he went into great detail, and those are the things that make up self. He talked about the social instinct, the security instinct, and the sex instinct. So let's look at that briefly, if you will. You know, I think we have to face the fact that when Bill wrote the big book in 1937, 38, 39, Bill was not a great spiritual giant. You know, he was a night school lawyer. Uh, he, he, he was a New York City stock speculator. Bill didn't know a hell of a lot about human nature at that time. But he was able to write one of the greatest books the world's ever seen dealing with spirituality and human nature. Surely, surely, God used Bill's hands to write the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. But 12 or 13 years later, I think Bill felt that he had some additional information that he could give to us that would make it easier for us to work the steps according to the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. There's always been a lot of question as to why he wrote the 12 and 12. Two or three reasons. Number one, he had had so much difficulty in getting the fellowship to accept the traditions that I think he felt if he could write a book that included the traditions and the steps, the traditions would be more acceptable to the fellowship. But I also think he had more information that he wanted to give to us. Now, a lot of people try to work the steps out of the 12 and 12. You can't do that. The 12 and 12 has no instructions, no directions on how to work the steps. And Bill said it's a series of essays designed to give us additional information so that we can better work the steps. But the only piece of literature that we have that tells us how to work them happens to be the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. But some of the information in the 12 and 12, I think, is just absolute brilliant information. He taught me more about what makes me tick, what makes me think the way I think and act the way I act. He taught me more on three or four pages of step four in the 12 and 12 than I had learned in some 40 some odd years of living. And it explained to me where self-will comes from and let me know the real results of self-will and let me see why it's absolutely necessary that I try to get from self-will to God's will if I want any peace of mind, serenity, and happiness. He talked there about the three basic instincts of life. And he said all human beings are born with these basic instincts of life, that they are God-given, they are absolutely necessary for survival of the human race. And the first one we talk about is the social instinct. And he said all human beings are born with a desire to be liked, to be accepted, to be accepted and, and respected by other people. He said all human beings are born with a desire to come together in groups with other people. And he said if we didn't have those desires, if we cared nothing at all about each other, that the world would go into a dog-eat-dog -dog situation, complete anarchy would reign, and sooner or later the human race would simply fail to survive under those conditions. Those these desires that you and I have to be liked and accepted and respected by other people, these desires that we have to come together in groups with other people, it's a very basic God-given thing, and it's necessary for our survival. It's a good thing. It's only when we overdo in some of those areas that it becomes a problem. He uses several terms under the social instinct. He used first the word companionship. And that's nothing more than wanting to belong or to be accepted. So many of us grew up on the outside of the crowd, wanted to be a part of, knew we could not be. Always on the outside of the crowd, looking in, never felt that we were accepted or, or, accept, or respected at all. Prestige. Prestige is wanting to be recognized or to be accepted as the leader of the group. And the world needs leaders. I guess even back in the old caveman days, somebody had to say, Joe, get behind that tree with your club. 
Mary Lou, you get over here with your spear. And Billy Jack and I'll run this sucker through here, and we'll have something to eat when we get through. Somebody has to make decisions. Most people will take one of two directions, either let me be a part of or let me be the leader of. In either case, it'll be based upon what other people think of us. If they like us and accept us and respect us, then we can become those things that we want to be. He uses the term self-esteem. Self-esteem is what we think of ourselves. And it's usually either excessively high or excessively low, one of the two. The way we feel about ourselves usually is based upon what we think other people think of us. If they seem to like us and accept us, we feel pretty good toward ourselves. If they don't like us and don't accept us, or we feel like they don't like us, then we feel pretty low toward ourselves. He used the term pride. And I'm glad I got in the habit of going to the dictionary. I always thought pride was something you're supposed to have. As a young boy growing up, all I ever wanted to be was a man who walked tall with pride and a little bit sideways like John Wayne did. That's all I ever wanted to be. <laughs> Until I went to the dictionary and looked it up. And it defines pride as an excessive and unjustified opinion of oneself. It's either too high or it's too low, and in either case, it's very seldom true. Personal relationships is nothing more than our relations with the world and, and the people in us. Our ambitions are the plans for the future that we have to gain power, recognition, prestige, acceptance, and etc., those are all God-given things, and they're all good things. Now, if we want to be liked and accepted and respected by the world and the people in it, the first thing we have to do is we'll decide, well, what is it they want from us? And society teaches these things as we grow up. As we, we hear other people talk, as we see other people act, as we listen to those adults who are older than we are, we are taught what it's necessary for us to become, to be liked, to be accepted, and be respected by other people. And based upon what society teaches us, then we begin to set goals in order to get that recognition. And, and what's needed to get the recognition and acceptance will vary in different parts of the world. Some parts of the world is to have a good education. Another part of the world, maybe it's to have a large family. Another part of the world, it may be to be a large landowner. It could be any number of things. But based upon what we see and what we're taught as we grow up, then we set goals for ourselves. Bill says we're like the actor that wants to run the whole show. We begin to write a little script in our mind as to what we want to become and the recognition and the acceptance that we're going to receive from these people. Now, if you want to... If you want to reach the goal, you're going to have to work at it. You can't just be a bum and sit on your duff and have people like you and accept you and respect you. By the same token, we're probably going to have to make some sacrifices. You know, there are some things that I would like to do as a human being that are very exciting and very enjoyable, but if I do them and you catch me at it, you're not going to like me at all. And I don't think you and I would do the work necessary to reach the goal nor make the sacrifices necessary unless we get a reward for doing so. And the great reward we get is just the moment of successful completion of the goal. Bill said it in his story when he said, I had arrived. How many of us have set the goal for the education or whatever it is? And we just literally work our tails off until we reach the goal and the moment we reach the goal and they pat us on the back and they say, ah, oh, Joe, you're a fine fella. You're doing great. You're a good man. We get one of those feelings that comes over us which is absolutely indescribably wonderful. One of the greatest feelings a human being can have when we get the praise and the recognition and etc. The only thing wrong with it, though, it seems to be just a temporary feeling. It doesn't last very long. And we get all that praise and recognition, and we look around, and we say, well, is this all there is to it? And we set another goal. And we work, and we work, and we strive, and we strive, and we 
we, we sacrifice and we reach the new goal and we get to praise and recognition and it feels great but it doesn't last long and we set another goal. And it seems to create within we human beings an insatiable desire for more and more power, more and more recognition, more and more acceptance, and we're not getting it fast enough. They're not giving it to us the way we think they ought to. So what do we do about that? Well, we start taking a few shortcuts. We start doing a little lying, a little conning, a little manipulating, a little climbing on other people's backs and stepping on their toes. And the instant we do so, we create pain and suffering for others. They, in turn, retaliate against us and create pain and suffering for us. Plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success because under those conditions, we're always in collision with people, places, and things. The second basic instinct he talked about is the security instinct. Now, I know in AA we try to live one day at a time. But Bill said all human beings are born with the desire to be secure in the future. He said if we didn't have that desire, we wouldn't provide the food, the clothing, the shelter, the things that we need. And next winter season, we would just simply freeze to death. Next drought season, we would simply just starve to death. If we didn't have the desire to be secure, we wouldn't join together with groups of other people so we could do for each other what we could not do for ourselves. I know we try to live one day at a time in AA, but nearly everybody in this room has got an insurance policy. And the purpose of the insurance policy is to protect ourselves in the future. If we're going to be secure, we once again have to determine, well, what do we need in order to be secure? Once again, society teaches us these things. In one part of the world, we just may need $4. Another part of the world, we may need 4000 Another part of the world, we may, may need $4 million. Another part of the world, we may need 192 coconuts. Whatever they use, they measure to trade and barter with. And based on what society teaches us, we set our goals. My God, how many of us have done it? We set the goal for the new pair of shoes. We set the goal for the new dress. We set the goal for the new bicycle. We set the goal for the new car. We set the goal for the new home. And we just work and work and work and strive our butts off. And the day we, we be, reach the goal and, and that thing is all paid for and nobody can touch it and take it away from us, my God, what a great feeling that is. You know, back in my, in my days when I was a kid growing up, very few people owned their own homes. Nearly everybody rented. Once in a great while, though, somebody would scrape up a little money, make a down payment on a little old three- or four-room house, and pay on that sucker month after month, year after year, and finally one day that thing is paid off. And the feeling is so great that they called in the neighbors, and we had a great celebration by burning the mortgage one of the greatest feelings a human being can have. And I don't think we would do the work necessary to reach the goal or make the sacrifices if we didn't get that kind of feeling from it. But once again, just like with a social instinct, it's just a temporary feeling. Hell, we no sooner get that sucker paid off and we look around and we say, well, well hell, hell, I, I'm, he's got a Cadillac and I'm in a Chevrolet. And this guy over here has got a Brooks Brothers suit, and I bought mine at Kmart's. And it calls us to become dissatisfied, and we set another goal. And we work, and we work, and we strive, and we strive, and we sacrifice, and we reach the new goal. And it seems to create within us an insatiable desire for more and more and more and more of these things. Not giving them to us fast enough and not getting it like we think we ought to. So what do we do? Well, we start taking shortcuts. We lie. We cheat, we con, we steal, we manipulate. And the instant we do so, we create pain and suffering for others. They, in turn, retaliate against us and create pain and suffering for us. Plain in a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success. Under those conditions, we're always in collision with people, places, and things. The third basic instinct he talked about is the sex instinct. And I always have to stop and take a little drink of coffee before we start on it. He gets excited about this. He said, all oh, human beings are born with a desire to have sex. And he said, it may get turned off by bad teachings or bad happenings, 
but he saw all human beings are born with a desire to have sex because if we don't have sex, we can't reproduce ourselves. And if we don't reproduce ourselves, then sure enough, sooner or later, the human race is going to fail to survive. Now, just like the other two, if you're going to reproduce yourself through the sexual act, you're going to have to work at it. Hell, you can do more work in three minutes of sex than you do all day digging a ditch. <laughs> Don't you older fellas remember how it used to be? My God, we got through with it. We just fell over sideways. The sweat just poured off of us. We feel like we've died, gone to heaven, come back two or three times. And I don't think we would do that kind of work if we didn't get a reward for doing so. And the great reward is that great feeling, both physically and emotionally, that we get at the moment of successful completion of the sex act. One of the greatest feelings a human being can experience. But also, just like the other two, it just seems to be a temporary feeling. Hell, you no sooner get through with doing it than you get to thinking about doing it again. <laughs> and it's such a pleasurable and such an exciting thing that the next thing you know, we get to thinking about doing it at the wrong time, in the wrong way, with the wrong people. And the next thing you know, we end up doing it the wrong way, at the wrong time, with the wrong people. And the instant we do so, we create pain and suffering for others. They, in turn, retaliate against us and create pain and suffering for us. Plain and life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success because under those conditions, we're always in collision with people, places, and things. Now this little chart up here shows those three basic instincts of life. And coming out of those three basic instincts of life, you see a little circle called self. That's what makes up self-will, those three basic instincts of life. Now, if all human beings on earth today could fulfill these three basic instincts of life at the level that God intended, there would be no conflict on earth today. All problems that human beings have stem from these three basic instincts of life. And the problem with them is God made them pleasurable so we would do so and that's the rub. They are so pleasurable that left on self-will, we cannot keep from overdoing in one or more of those areas. And when we start overdoing in one or more of those areas, then we be begin to create problems for other people. And you'll notice another little circle coming out of self called wrongs. It's another word you have to look at. Somewhere we got the idea that the word wrongs was a list of dirty, filthy, nasty things. No, you go to the dictionary and look it up, and you'll find several definitions of the word wrongs. One definition is incorrect judgment of others. And we're going to find out a little later on that's exactly what our resentment is. Another definition of the word wrongs is incorrect believing. And a little later on, we're going to find out that's what most of our fears are. Another definition of the word wrongs are the harms and the hurts that we do to other human beings. It's very easy to spot a selfish, self-centered human being. A selfish, self-centered human being will always display three common manifestations of self. Number one, they're always madder than hell damn him and damn her and by God I'll show them and they're not going to treat me that way and blah, 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 blah. Selfie, self-centered human beings are always scared to death. Can't depend on God. Can't depend on other human beings. If we're an alcoholic reaching the end of the road, we can't depend on ourselves any longer and we're running absolutely scared to death. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we know when it gets here, it ain't going to be worth a damn whatever it is. Selfish, self-centered human being is eaten up with guilt and remorse associated with the harms that we do to other people. You know, we're not drunken bums. We alcoholics have got a conscience and the guilt and remorse associated with the things that we've done to hurt others just literally eats us up. Now, a mind that is filled with resentments, rage and anger, a mind that is filled with fear and worry, a mind that is filled with guilt and remorse does not feel good. And we'll feel bad just so long. 
and the mind starts searching for the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a couple of drinks. And next thing you know, we believe it's okay to drink, and we end up drunk all over again. So at the very least, if we're going to stay sober, it looks as though we're going to have to do something about this self-will thing. Without it, we're going to stay restless and irritable and discontented and filled with shame, fear, and guilt and remorse. And eventually it caused us to go right back to drinking. I never understood page 60 and 61 until we saw this information in the 12 and 12. And that's what makes us like the actor that wants to run the whole show. You know, as we grow up in the satisfaction of these instincts, we write a script in our head for what we're going to be. And we set out to fulfill that script. Now, and that wouldn't be so bad. But we also write one in there for other people, see? I wrote a script in my mind for my wife to be. Now, she's going to be this and this and that and that, and people are going to look at her, and they're going to say, Oh, my God, would you look at that great wife that old Charlie's got? He must be a real, real good fellow. I wrote a script in my mind for my children. You know, this one's going to do that, and that one's going to do that, and this one's going to become this, and people are going to look at my children, and they're going to say, What a great father that man is. Just look how great their children is. The only problem is, I didn't know, but my wife had a script in her head for herself. My children had a script in their head for themselves, and they didn't want to play the game that I wanted to play. So what did I do? Rather than back off and let them be what they wanted to be, I continually tried to enforce my script upon their life, and our life became an absolute living hell. And it might not have been so bad if I'd have stopped it with my family, but hell, I, I did that with everything and everybody. My friends, my neighbors, my co-workers, I always knew what was best for them. And if they would just do what I wanted them to do, then everything would turn out just great for all of us. I damn near kill me trying to enforce my will on other human beings. And if I'm going to have any peace of mind, it looks like I'm going to have to do something about that. Joe? Let's go to page 62. So he told us how it works. Now he's going to tell us how it don't, why it won't work. He said, selfishness and self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. We're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that sometime in the past, we've made decisions based on self, which later put us in a position to be hurt. Would you read that again, please? Yeah, but we invariably find that sometime in the past, we've made decisions based upon the satisfaction of our basic instincts of life, which later put us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us. And God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us have had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we would like to. Neither could we reduce our self as much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. Can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. We must have God's help. The greatest mistake we see people making in AA today is trying to make themselves become better. And self-will cannot overcome self-will. The only thing that can overcome self-will is, is the power that made it in the first place, which is God. So it looks like we're going to have to have God's help if we want to do anything about this self-will. There's only two wills anyhow. There's God's will and there's self-will. And at any one given time, we can only be operating on one or the other. And we just can't force ourselves to be better. How many of us have tried it? God, I used to get in all kinds of hot water and I'd swear I'll never do this again and turn right around and do the same old things over and over and over and more. I had to have God's help. So he told us how it works, told us why it won't work. Now he's going to tell us how it really works. He said, this is the how and why of it. First instruction. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. And all I'd been trying to do was play God in my life and the lives of other people. It just didn't work. I had to quit doing that. 
and then next, we decide that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. Not our suggester, our director. <laughs> now he's got his word right back in. It'll be director from now on. said, so he is the principal and we're his agents. And he's the father and we're his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arts through which we were passed to freedom. And boy, I almost missed that. I mean, I really almost missed that simple idea. Because, you see, I use God like an errand boy. When, early in my sobriety, I said, God, I need to get my wife back. I need to stay sober. I need to get a, make more money. I need a new car. Would you take care of those things for me? <laughs> I use God like an errand boy. After I'd been sober for a while, I got to reading in that other big, big book. And in the front of it, there's a story in there that said he worked for six days and then he rested. And to my knowledge, he'd never go back to work anymore. It looks to me like there'll be any work being done around here. It's going to be me. <laughs> this is very, <laughs> this is very, very important here. Yeah. So, Next, we decided here after this drama life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father, and we are his children. He's the boss. I work for him. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. Now, once again, we're referring to the wonderfully effective spiritual structure. And back in the old days, when they built the arches, they didn't have the mortar and stuff. There was a certain stone up in the top of that arch. It was called the keystone. And the other stones leaned against the keystone, and the keystone supported the whole arch. If it was cut right, the thing would support the arch. If it was faulty, it would slip out. Okay, the new and triumphant or the wonderfully effective spiritual structure through which we're going to pass to freedom is going to be an arch. And the keystone of that arch is the simple little idea that we're going to let God be the director. Willingness was the foundation, step one. Believing was the cornerstone, step two. And now then he tells us it's an arch and decision to let God be the director will be the keystone of that arch. You see, we're building our personality change. We're building our spiritual experience as we work our way through the steps. And each step will give us some kind of positive happening. Page 63, it said, Now, when we sincerely took such a position, the one there that he's the father, we're the children, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. See, I'm supposed to perform his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we, began, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. See, I'd always been a taker, and takers are losers, not only in life but in AA and everywhere. Takers are losers, and I was a taker. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter, we were reborn. And boy, I used to hate that idea about being reborn. There was up the church, up the road from where I live, was a, a church up there, and every on Monday night they used to come down my house and knock on the door and want to talk to me about being reborn. And you know what I did for them, didn't you? I run them off. I said, boys, let me tell you, this is Monday night football. <laughs> and you're down here messing with me with this stuff, and I'm drinking and having a good time. Just get out of here. Leave me alone. I didn't understand what they meant by that. And after I'd been sober for a while, I read in the other book, there was a story, and this guy's name was Nicodemus. He's just like me, dumb as a rock. I mean, really. <laughs> he asked that fellow who'd been talking about being reborn, he said, when you talk about being reborn, do you mean I got to go back into my mother's womb and be reborn? Now, my sponsors looked at me many times and just kind of shook his head. And I can see this guy shaking his head at Nicodemus. He said, man, don't you know, didn't you go to university? Aren't you educated? Don't you know that you can't do that? I mean, surely you ought to know that. When I'm talking to you about being reborn, I'm talking about the renewing of your mind. Old ideas cast aside. New ones accepted. 
reborn, not in my body, but in my head. The ideas, the emotions, and attitudes. I was, I, I was able to understand that now.